Well, hello there, and welcome to yet a fa another fascinating module on leading organizational change. In this session, we're going to be talking about the content of chapters 5 and 6 combined, um, which are on the consulting process uh, and then entry and contracting. Um, by the consulting process, I'm referring to the steps, if you will, that an organizational development consultant would go through uh, when interacting with a client. And, of course, that first step is going to be what's called entry and contracting. So we're going to combine those um, in this session. Um, the first thing that I want to begin talking about are some of the various models of consulting um, that exist out there and then um, talk more about the one that is most likely to be used in the OD process. Um, one of the first models is what's called an expert model. Um, expert models are noted more by really the fact that they are more narrow in scope. Um, usually the client has already diagnosed the problem, and, and what they've done is they're hiring someone to come in and implement what they consider to be the solution in that case there. And so an expert is someone who typically tends to have a narrow but perhaps deep knowledge um, of a given area. Um, another model is the doctor-patient model. Um, if you recall, anytime you go to a doctor, what typically happens is that you tell them your symptoms. Um, they um, Oftentimes what they do is they just sort of diagnose you right then and there, or they actually may run a few steps, but ultimately what they end up doing is writing you a prescription and then sending you on your way, or perhaps even making a recommendation um, at some point. So this is what's called the doctor-patient model. Um, another model um, is something called the mechanic model. And oftentimes, um, you think about it, when you go to the mechanic, oftentimes what you tell the mechanic is what you sense to be wrong in the hopes that they would then engage in the process of diagnosis and they would fix it. And by the time you get your vehicle back, everything's fixed um, without you having to actually have been involved at all in the process. So you're not involved in the diagnosis. You're definitely not involved in repairing the problem. Um, or anything like that, um, hopefully get your car working back in place. If it doesn't work, you take it back to the mechanic and tell them to fix it all over again. As it turns out, neither of these models are actually appropriate models for OD, um, you know, given the values that, I w that I've talked about in our previous um, sessions. The model that fits OD is something called a process model. Okay, Process model. So let's talk a little bit more about that process model as we consider sort of the OD um, model of operating. First of all, clients are the experts in the organization. You know, it would be pretty, um, would be the word arrogant, I think, to assume that you actually know more about an organization um, than the client would be. In fact, when I was in graduate school, um, there was a business professor uh, to say that he had a large ego would be an understatement, but he was also a very powerful consultant. He actually had an endowed chair. Um, and one of the things that he would say is that anytime he went to go work for an organization and he only worked with CEOs, um, he would say that unless the CEO is willing to admit that he, the professor, knows more about the organization than the CEO does, he wouldn't take on the case. Now, I personally found it hard to believe that anybody would ever admit to something like that, but once again, he was quite a powerful um, consultant um, in that world. So, um, but, but I would say the OD approach is exactly the opposite of that. In fact, oftentimes, I try to get my clients to recognize um, that they definitely know more about their organization than I do and that I'm really coming in as a learner. So once again, the OD approach is that the clients are the experts, right? And so this would definitely be in opposition to the expert model in which they would be seeking someone to come in and fix some particular area. Um, 
another um, aspect of the process model, and that is that there's always joint diagnosis and problem solving. Neither the consultant nor the organization should be diagnosing and solving the problem by themselves. So this is in contrast, if you will, to the doctor-patient model in the sense where the doctor would be the only one writing the prescription. It's really a joint process. You are working with um, the client um, to um, figure out what this problem is. Another aspect of the process consulting model is that the client needs to recognize the problem and take action. And so definitely this wouldn't be the mechanic model where the client just simply says, here's what's wrong, and disappears and hopes by the time they turn back up, you will have fixed the problem. Um, oftentimes what an OD consultant really attempts to do is to simply design a process by which you walk the client through and helping to sort of diagnose the problem in that case there. So it's definitely, once again, a, an aspect of joint diagnosis. And then um, probably a final aspect of the process consulting model, um, <clears throat> and that is that as a consultant, it's your job to help fix the problem and then and transfer problem-solving skills. This is that capacity-building aspect that I believe that I've mentioned already in a previous session. It's very important that you not only fix the problem, but also that you transfer that capacity for fixing future problems like these um, to the client. And once again, this would be unlike each of the other models. Um, experts typically don't um, train the client in how to, you know, do whatever they do. Um, definitely doctors don't um, show their patients uh, how to engage in medical diagnosis, and mechanics typically don't come out and show you how to fix things even when they're simple. Right? In many ways, each of the other three models really depend upon repeat business. But you know, the job of an OD consultant is essentially to work yourself out of a job because you know, after um, so much time, the consultant, I'm sorry, the organization really shouldn't need you anymore. They should be able to fix that problem. Now, once again, there are definitely some situations in which they simply aren't going to develop that kind of capacity, but they should definitely have a greater understanding of the phenomena than they did before um, you came. Okay, so so these are really aspects of um, the OD process consulting model. Let's now look at some of the principles of OD consultation. Um, number one is that you should always try to be helpful in what it is that you're doing as an OD consultant. Um, a big one here is to assess your ignorance. Um, one of the ethical dilemmas that you never want to get yourself into, and that is selling things that you really can't do. And so being aware of what you don't know and obviously being able to be upfront about that with clients is a very important ethical value in OD. Um, here's a real big one, and that is that understanding that everything you do is an intervention. Even going in and engaging in the assessment process. I mean, typically, if you're, you know, in the assessment process, you're really gathering information for the purpose of diagnosing the problem. So technically speaking, you're not at the level to where you're engaging in interventions. But even that is actually an intervention. You know, take something as simple as, say, a job satisfaction survey. Believe it or not, some people don't really know how bad it is to work there until you ask them. <laughs> Right? They've never really thought about how bad this place really sucks to work at. And yet here you come in with your job satisfaction survey, and only when they're filling that out is it now becoming aware of them that, boy, this is a really crummy place to work. So believe it or not, you've just engaged in an intervention, one in which is going to now require fixing in some ways. And so everything you do, something as subtle as going in and beginning to interview the client is an intervention in and of itself. So always being aware of the consequences, if you will, to everything that you do. Another important piece is that everything is data. Every conversation, everything is something to be paid attention to. Um, cultural artifacts, the, the um, you know, even the rooms that you meet in when you go um, to an organization speaks volumes about the value that's being placed on um, what you do. 
right? If people are meeting you outside, you know, at a park bench, you know, that says a lot versus, you know, um, bringing you into a, a massive, nice um, conference room, for example, I think says a lot about the value that they're placing on the work that they're going to ultimately ask you to do. Uh, another important point is that it's the client who owns the problem, and therefore they own the solution. Right? Um, it's very important um, that this becomes an aspect of what you do. Reason being here is that, you know, um, in an OD process consulting approach, if it's done right, clients are almost always satisfied. Because, in a sense, as a consultant, you've never had to talk them into anything. You've simply helped them to decide uh, what the best approach, approach would be. And so, in that sense, clients feel more empowered um, by going through this process as long as you make sure they own the problem. Owning the problem means that, you know, um, they, um, along with your assistants, have discovered the problem and therefore um, they with your assistance have figured out what the solutions would be and they with your assistance have figured out how to best implement that particular solution. Okay, um, Got to go with the flow um, as an OD consultant. Right? Timing is crucial. Um, oftentimes organizations are you know for a variety of reasons needing to expedite things. On the other hand um, you know, sometimes they don't move as fast. And so having some appreciation for that um, is very important. On the other hand, though, I think, you know, you want to be aware of how timing may impact the success of whatever you're trying to do and, and trying to find some sense of balance for that. Um, and then finally, when in doubt, share the problem. What I mean by that is that oftentimes when you're stumped, about a diagnosis or you're stumped about a solution to that, it helps to have, you know, someone else that you can kind of go and kind of share that problem with. Um, there's something in the consulting world called a shadow consultant. And this is oftentimes another colleague, if you will, um, that you can kind of go to and you can kind of share, you know, um, what in fact um, is going on there. And they may actually be um, a, another set of eyes, if you will. Um, you know, that can give you some advice on um, how to proceed. Okay. So if we were to look at the consulting process as a model, it would look something like this, where at the top we have entry, um, moving then to the contracting phase, um, to data gathering phase, then to a diagnosis, presumably based upon the data that you've gathered, then feedback um, back to the client, um, with then mutual decision on the intervention, evaluating um, the success of the intervention. Um, oftentimes, evaluation is broken up into two forms of evaluation. That's what's called formative evaluation. That's the evaluation that's fed back for the purpose of perhaps improving the, the delivery, if you will, of the intervention. Uh, but then there's summative evaluation. That's evaluation on the actual success of the intervention. Um, and then presumably want the, once there's been some success with that and you found ways of sustaining that momentum, oftentimes what we call uh, um, the, uh, um, <coughs> excuse me, uh, <coughs> sorry, um, had something go down the wrong pipe. <laughs> uh, when you're going to um, uh, sustain that intervention in the organization, right, then you would move to exit, right, exit of the consultant. So, so this is essentially the consulting process. Okay? So let's begin with this first step, and that's the step of entry. Right? What we mean by entry is simply getting in, getting started, and learning the client, if you will. Um, one of the first things that you want to pay attention to is the fact that there are different types of clients that you are dealing with. Um, for example, there are contact clients. Right? This is typically the person who called you um, and um, asked you to come for a visit. Um, and typically in that phone conversation or perhaps if you bumped into them some space, you're getting some kind of initial point of view from the contact client. Right. Then there are intermediate clients. Right? These are those clients that are going to be included in meetings. 
um, from whom data is going to be gathered during the course, course of the engagement. Oftentimes, when I go into an organization, I'm not just meeting with a single individual. There's some kind of committee that's been formed, um, and typically I'm actually being interviewed, if you will, by this committee. So on this committee of persons um, would be these intermediate clients. Then there are primary clients, right? Um, this is actually the person in charge, ultimately the person who's going to be paying your fee. And oftentimes there's a big distinction between the contact client and the primary client um, in that case. So the person who calls you um, is generally some kind of um, clerk or assistant working for the primary clients. Um, in much of the work that I do, primary clients have typically been vice presidents or CEOs or that kind of thing there. But these are the people who truly own the problem, whose job is on the line, if you will, um, for whatever problem um, that's being fixed or needs to be fixed. Then there are unwitting clients, right? These are the people um, who are likely to be affected by engagement or the intervention, um, but they're really not aware of what's taking place at the time. And somewhat on the flip side, are indirect clients. These are people um, who are not known to you as the consultant, but these people are conscious that they're stakeholders in a given outcome. And so this would be somewhat of a blind spot for the consultant. So it would be, you know, so typically these are the kind of people that you actually want to eventually get, get to know or, or know that they exist. And then there are the ultimate clients. Right? When it's all said and done, this is the larger group of people whom are once again going to be um, impacted by whatever intervention you take place. And so one of the things that you're doing upon entry is, is you're trying to kind of learn the people. You're trying to size people up. You're trying to sort of place them into um, any one of these particular categories. Okay? So then once you have entered the organization, um, then the contracting process begins. By contracting, we simply mean the process of coming to an agreement on what the OD project will do. Contracting can be either written or verbal. Even though it can be verbal, my um, piece of advice is that it always be written. Now, the written doesn't always even have to be that formal. So um, there have been occasions in which my contract, if you will, was nothing more than a written letter, but in that letter, I specified all the things that you need to specify um, in a contracting letter. Other times it's been a lot more formal in terms of an actual proposal of work in that case there, but definitely either way I suggest that it's written because oftentimes memories can be selective um, in terms of um, what the agreement was. Um, another thing that you're trying to do is you're trying to understand the client's perception of the situation or the problem. Okay. Um, this can be um, oftentimes very challenging, um, um, but this is what you're really trying to get some sense of. You're attempting to elicit mutual wants and expectations. Um, so in that sense, um, you know, you're trying to really figure out what it is that the client wants, what their expectation is going to be of what it is that you can actually achieve or bring to the table. Of course, also as a consultant, you, you need to be somewhat clear about your wants and what your expectations are um, when engaging in an OG consultation process. Um, another big one is defining success. What will success look like in that case there? Um, will it be merely um, a change in attitude? You know, is it just simply defined by satisfaction or will there need to be some tangible product or service, some kind of change or something like that. So being clear in terms of what that looks like I think is very important here. Um, and then finally, um, you know, contracting is not a one-time event. Um, I oftentimes find myself in the process of having to recontract um, along the way. So for example, I'm currently working with a client that I've been working with now for three years. Uh, when I was first um, contracted, if you will, first hired, um, I met directly with the president of this particular organization. Um, since then, they hired in a vice president and they wanted to make the project that I was working on a part of this person's responsibility. So then I essentially found myself having to 
recontract, if you will, with this vice president. And once I recontracted and got a very good working relationship, that person left <laughs> after about seven months. Um, you know, um, I'm happy to report that it had nothing to do with me, um, but I think there were some problems with, between that person and the organization. Um, and then another vice president was brought in, so then I actually had to recontract with this um, other vice president, who I'm happy to report is still in place, um, but sort of quite busy. So in this sense, I've had to go through this contracting phase <clears throat> um, three times with this organization. Um, and you can actually go through this oftentimes um, with the same person. If some circumstances change, um, either for the client or for yourself as a consultant, right, you'll find yourself having to go through the recontracting phase. Um, and oftentimes this is where it might be perhaps more verbal um, than written, but even in that case I would suggest that it, it's more written um, than verbal. Okay? So let's talk about some of the questions um, that you need to get answered um, when you are um, <clears throat> in an organization. Number one, what does the client want? Right, we talked about the idea of finding out their wants and expectations. Um, what do you need from the client in order to accomplish what the client wants? Right? So, so being able to know what, it, what kind of resources that you're going to need. One of the things I like to think about, and that is you know, what I call the, the three T's, time, talent, and treasure. Right? How much time am I going to need the client to be able to devote to the project? What kind of talent, in other words, what kind of personnel in their organization am I going to need? And then treasure, money. Um, what kind of financial resources am I going to need in order to bring about what the client wants? Okay? Um, what will you do? Um, what will you deliver? Uh, we oftentimes use the term deliverables. What are the deliverables in that case there? You know, are you delivering primarily a process? Are you delivering a report? Are you delivering some kind of tangible um, product, if you will? Um, what is it that you'll deliver? What will your role be? And what will the client's role be? Once again, the OD process role tends to be more typically that of a facilitator of a process. You know, but there actually are times when, because of whatever the nature of the issue is, you may in fact have to step more into, say, the expert role um, in that case there. And so being somewhat clear about when that will need to be. Um, so, for example, in a lot of the circumstances in which I find myself, um, I'm having to in, engage in the collection of data and data analysis. Oftentimes the clients do not possess the expertise to engage in data analysis and so whereas as a as a process consultant it'd be nice to have them sitting next to me while I'm analyzing um, the data um, using statistical methodology, oftentimes they simply don't possess that knowledge. And so in that case, my role tends to change from more process to an expert, usually in that one narrow area, statistical analysis, in that case there. But then once I've done that statistical analysis, I tend to sort of then sort of spring back into my process role. And so um, generally I'm presenting that data back to the client, and now it's the client's role to look at this data with me and once again to kind of interpret what that data means and what the next directions uh, might be. Um, what's the time schedule? Um, and um, once again making sure that the time schedule is an adequate one um, for what the work that is required to do. What about confidentiality? This is a big one. Um, once again we're hitting on ethical considerations. Um, generally um, it's very important to point out to clients um, that if you're going to gather data and gather that data anonymously or with confidentiality um, being given to employees or uh, members of the organization, it's also very important that the clients understand that you must maintain that confidentiality. If that was given um, to um, respondents, say, in a survey, um, then that has to be maintained. And then the question becomes, how is that confidentiality going to be maintained? Um, so, for example, um, generally if I'm reporting back data and let's say we've decided to break that data down by departments, 
Um, sometimes departments are pretty small. There are only, you know, three or four people in a given department. Um, I will draw the line in terms of what the smallest number um, that I'll report on. So generally my number is generally about four. Um, if I have less than um, um, four respondents um, to that, I simply will not provide any data. So if I only have two people, I'm not going to provide even an average of those two people, or three people for that matter. So I need at least four people in order to provide, say, an average for that department. Right? And so that's an example of confidentiality because then it would be too easy to figure out um, who those respondents might be. Um, how and when will you give feedback? Once again, this is part of that time schedule. Um, will there be intervals in which you'll give back feedback to the client? Um, and if so, how will you do that? Will it be, say, in a verbal presentation? Um, or will it be in a report or perhaps some combination of both of those? Okay, so once again, these are the questions um, that both the client and the consultant will need to have answered as a part of the contracting process. So let's talk about the contracting meeting itself, right? When you're sitting face-to-face -face with the client, what are some things that you should be doing? Um, well, you should be asking, listening, and then paraphrasing the feedback. So you might say something like this, so it sounds like you're having difficulty with coordination between the marketing and sales departments. Right? And this, I think, you know, for any of you that have had any kind of training on listening skills, you'll recognize this as being a typical thing that you ought to do anytime you're listening. You ought to paraphrase, you ought to repeat back what it is that you sound, I'm sorry, what it is that, it, that you're hearing um, the client say. Um, clarifying the problem, right? What do you mean by X, right? What do you mean by people here don't seem to be motivated? In that case, I'm trying to get uh, get out a sense of what is their operational definition of motivation. Motivation is a very abstract and vague concept, and so I, I simply want to know what they mean by that. For them, it may mean that their productivity is slacking, or it may mean that they're not smiling here. Right? And there are a number of concepts like this, right? Things like, you know, people here aren't committed. Well, what does that mean? What does commitment committed mean? Um, to you as a client. It may mean that they're not coming to the department picnic, right? Um, as opposed to it may mean that they're not coming um, to the organization. So oftentimes I find myself being in a position of where I'm asking them to be a little bit more concrete about what they mean by certain constructs. Right? And also getting some sense of the frequency of the problem. How often does X happen? Right? When you say that people tend to slack off around the place, how often are we talking about that? Is that something that you're only really noticing quarterly, or is that something that we're noticing every day? It gives me some sense of the magnitude um, of the problem here. Right? So I'm wanting some clarification on what it is that they're talking about. Um, one of the things you want to do is you want to give support. Right? You know, um, oftentimes I appreciate your willingness to talk to me about this difficult problem. Um, it's not very easy for clients to oftentimes share, if you will, their dirty laundry in that case there. And so you want to kind of make it welcoming. You want to kind of you know, let them know um, that you don't take for granted the fact that they're willing to kind of open up about the kind of problems that they're having. Um, you want to communicate an understanding of the problem. Right? It's common for groups to feel competitive in this manner, but the time pressure placed on both groups makes this situation unique. And so you definitely want to communicate them that you have some understanding. Right? Um, people like to know that they're not in the predicament alone. And so demonstrating your understanding of the problem makes them feel like, makes them feel comfortable um, with that case there. You want to be explicit um, about um, what is it you think. Right? I want to be clear, I don't think we can solve this problem with one workshop. Right? Um, oftentimes clients are calling you in and not only have they done um, the diagnosis, but they think they know what the solution is and so they call you in um, and what they oftentimes think is giving you the problem is the solution. Right? So saying that we want you to do a workshop on diversity. Right? Um, they've already um, concluded in their own minds that it's a workshop on diversity that's needed as opposed to say something like an overhaul of the policies in the organization. And so being explicit about how you're viewing issues here is very important. 
And then finally, um, you want to end with feedback. Um, you know, oftentimes you want to kind of give a little bit of the game away. Um, as a consultant, um, you know, oftentimes I tend to give a little bit of, um, you know, the game away for organizations. Um, honestly, sometimes this has gotten me into trouble. <laughs> I remember one time with a particular client, and we were kind of doing an over-the-phone meeting, and this is a relatively large organization, and so before they flew me in, if you will, they wanted a little bit of feedback, and as it turns out, I think I kind of fixed, if you will, um, I say that in quotation marks, um, kind of fixed their problem just over the phone. Um, and by the time we got off the phone, I could tell that they, at least in their minds, thought that I'd sort of given them the whole solution to their problem, and they, you know, thanked me for it and even asked, you know, how much they owed me, I thinking that perhaps they were going to really kind of follow up and maybe sort of invite me in, said, oh, well, you don't owe me anything for that, um, only to... Um, eventually find out that, um, you know, they weren't going to fly me in, right? As far as they were concerned, you know, they got all they needed from me over the phone. Um, and so, um, but you do want to give a little bit of the game away. You do want to kind of give them a little bit of, you know, kind of what you're thinking. But in a sense, you also want to caution them against the idea um, that what you're sharing that's coming off the top of your head is in fact a true careful diagnosis because there are definitely more careful processes that need to be um, dealt with there. Okay? Um, oftentimes when you are going through this contracting phase, um, you really get to a point to where you're beginning to sense that you're in a little bit of an impasse um, with the client. Um, what we can simply refer to as getting stuck in the contracting phase. So let's talk about what that might look like. Um, you know, disagreement over the goals, resources, the time that it takes, right? The client is really persisting on a certain goal, you know, and maybe you don't think that's really kind of the appropriate goal for them to really shoot for. Um, or the resources that are needed, right? They want, typically they want you to do more with less that case there. And generally, um, people want you to fix things really quick. Um, and the client oftentimes does not have an appreciation for the amount of time that it takes to do something well. Right? And you can't get them to sort of truly appreciate that. Um, might also be that where they just sort of keep restating the problem um, over and over and over again. Right? And so oftentimes people aren't ready, if I will, or able or willing to move beyond that particular phase of things. Then there's sort of the nonverbals, right? Um, yawning, which is typically a indication of lack of interest or boredom, and they're looking at their watch, right? They're really wanting to speed things up. This oftentimes indicates to a consultant that, you know, um, these people are really going to want to just kind of bring you on and disappear, right? They're not going to want to be involved in an OD process, if you will, they're probably much more interested in an expert or a mechanic approach, if you will. <coughs> um, but then also, um, you know, kind of more the indirect, indirect answers um, problem, right, where they're, you know, um, they are indirectly um, sort of providing answers, right. So, so, so all of these things um, are the kind of things that might suggest that you're somewhat stuck. So when you're stuck, well, how do you proceed? Well, first of all is just to admit it. Right? I think we're stuck here. Right? I think we've got an impasse here that we sort of might um, work at. What you might do then is to change your offer. Um, you, you know, in as much as you are willing to bend um, with the things that you want to do so as to better match what the client wants, you might do that. Um, or you might change the objective in that case there. Um, you know, um, <clears throat> maybe rather than shooting for the moon here, right, um, perhaps um, for what it is that you want me to do, maybe just shooting for maybe a change in awareness or a change in attitudes might be the perfect thing to do. Another thing to do is simply to take a break. Maybe to end that particular meeting, agree to come back and meet again, um, sometimes the passage of time helps people to sort of mature in their thought. And then finally, um, when none of those seem like they're going to work, to go ahead and terminate 
or perhaps minimize the engagement, right? Basically say, you know, for what it is that you folks are wanting me to do doesn't really match up with what it is that I'm either willing to do or perhaps even what I can do for you. Or once again, to minimize the engagement um, to suggest that perhaps, you know, I can't really do all of that, but here's sort of maybe a portion of that that I can do. Um, and perhaps you can find someone else, or maybe I can even assist you in finding someone else in terms of doing that. There have definitely been occasions in which, um, as a project has evolved, it's become sort of clear to me that in the direction that it's going, it's really not something that I would like to do. And so in that case, I've kind of shifted into the role of a matchmaker. Um, I help the client to actually find someone uh, who could then come in and do what it is that they actually wanted um, to be done in that place there. So, so once again, that's a part of that recontracting phase. Right? At that point, I was contracted as a matchmaker, uh, more so than as a deliverer of services um, in that process. Okay? So here endeth our session on chapters um, 5 and 6 on the consulting process, and then step 1 of that process, which is the entry and contracting phases. So until our next session, um, take care, and I look for you in the discussion boards. Bye-bye.